following interview was conducted with Bartow Culp, the chemistry librarian at Purdue University, uh, for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Monday, June 22, 2009, in Stewart Center 263. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the oral history librarian. Welcome, Bartow, and good afternoon to you. Uh, good afternoon, Katie. And let's start with, tell us where and when you were born and your parents and siblings in early years. Sure. Um, I was born on October 12, 1940, um, and my, uh, my parents, well, I was born in Charleston, South Carolina. And my parents were both from South Carolina, but from upstate. My father from the little town of Union, South Carolina, in the central part of the state, and my mother from the small town Johnston, SC, which is over close to the border with uh, uh, Georgia and in the middle of the best peach growing area in the state. They, they claim to grow more peaches in that county than all the state of Georgia. But anyway. <laughs> um, and, uh, but, um, Any siblings? And tell us about grade school. Yeah, I'm the oldest of, of four. I um, have a, a two sisters, a younger sister Hunter and a young one, seven, she's Hunter's three years and two months younger than I am. And my uh, the other sister, Dunlap, was uh, seven years younger, and my uh, brother, B Benjamin, was uh, eight years younger than I am. And we all grew up um, in, uh, in the house in the old part of Charleston. And um, I went to school there, uh, went to uh, grade school. And, uh, Tell us a little bit about high school. What was that like? What oh, activities and things? Yeah, well, I... I was at this boys' school through the 10th grade and then transferred to the local high school. And <clears throat> like many public institutions in the South and during the uh, prior to um, uh, integration um, of the schools, it was, uh, you know, it was not great. But we had, we had some wonderful teachers. Um, and one of the best ones was uh, Mr. Coolidge. My, um, taught chemistry and he uh, he was in, instrumental in getting me very interested in chemistry although my father was also a chemistry teacher he taught at the medical university uh, in Charleston there uh, taught there for 40 odd years before he retired and uh, so I was interested in chemistry and in, in, in te technical things from, from the high school area uh, when I graduated from high school I had I got a, a scholarship, but it was in engineering. I was, I was a chemical engineer for the first couple of years. Um, and I went to Auburn University in Alabama, and I, I realized that in my sophomore year that um, I was not cut out to be an engineer. Uh, for one thing, I it was terrible in physics, and, and another, I just kept on sitting on my slide rule and breaking it. I broke two slide rules by sitting on them, and I figured that was not uh, going to bode well for me as uh, being an engineer. Um, so for my junior year, I, I transferred back to the University of South Carolina uh, and, um, and, and majored in chemistry and graduated uh, with a BS in chemistry at the University of South Carolina in, in 1963. Um, Tell us what college was like, my activities and what sort of things that you were, did you live at home or? Um, I lived, like well, the, the university is in Columbia, my home was in Charleston, but um, um, I lived in the dorm for a year and then, then had an apartment with some friends for, um, uh, for the rest of my tenure there. And uh, um, it, it's, a, it's an interesting, it's, it's a historic university, it was founded in um, the early 1800s, and uh, I remember the library. Uh, we had a, we had a new library at the time. It was called the Thomas Cooper Library. And we knew vaguely that Thomas Cooper was one of the early presidents of the university, but we really didn't care, you know. About it. But the Thomas Cooper Library was a good place because it, uh, it was a very modernistic building, and it had very comfortable chairs, and you could go to sleep in them. Um, and so uh, we spent a fair amount of time in, the li in that library. Um, it wasn't until I got to Purdue that I re got reacquainted with exactly who Thomas Cooper was. We'll talk about that later. Um, I, I, um, my activities were not, uh, I, I didn't, I wasn't a member of a fraternity or anything. Um, I, uh, 
I had a good a good group of friends, and we liked to we liked the outdoors. Um, and there's all kinds of things you can do, camping and stuff. Um, but um, um, you know, for the for the for the rest of it, we just did the usual. Is that house. When you did some cooking? Started your cooking specialties? Oh <laughs> no, that that, that came that, that came, came on later. That okay. came on later. Yeah, the uh, the the, um, the kitchen in our in our apartment in in at Columbia, at, uh, in Columbia is on Green Street, just down from the university. The kitchen was an absolute horror. We didn't ever wash dishes until the last, uh, the last dish got dirty, and then we had to then we had to wash them and clean the crud off of them and stuff. Um, we uh, we we mostly I, I hung around with graduate students, and we mostly would would hit these various restaurants and places in town that had buffets on certain tables that all you could eat buffets. And, and my friends, who were all eager eaters, had figured out where you could go on different days to get a buffet. And um, <laughs> I was a tiny little person, and they were very large people. Um, <coughs> and the, uh, the restaurant owners shrank when they saw us coming. Um, I only ate about one or two portions, but the rest of them did pretty well. Um, it was their meal for the day. It was, yeah. indeed, yeah. yeah. Um, right. um, <laughs> and so... Uh, when I was in, as an undergraduate in chemistry, I started doing research, um, doing undergraduate research with a professor there, and uh, was interested um, early on in doing research. It was fun. It was, uh, I think, a lot of people go into chemistry because they just like to play in the lab, and I was one of them. And uh, we had um, a pretty decent. Um, uh, teaching faculty there, and uh, a few gifted professors who really knew how to teach, really, really taught very well. Um, and, uh, and so my my interest in, in chemistry was, was you know still still sure. fairly fairly active. I liked organic chemistry a lot, um, and uh, the uh, I remember the the two summers that. Um, no, normally, people go and do something else. I was, I was, uh, I was doing research in the summertime, and after I got my bachelor's, I sort of segued over into into the graduate school there. Um, I started my my graduate work at Carolina, which was a mistake um, because I, was, I didn't think about it as a, a really different environment. It was just sort of like a continuing to take classes and. Make Same decent, side. make decent grades. So, so after a year, I, um, with the, with the, with the happy concurrence of my research director, I, um, I, I, I moved to the University of Delaware. And how did you have to pick Delaware? Well, uh, he he had done a postdoc there, or his wife had done a postdoc there, and uh, while he had worked at Dupont, and so he had a. Uh, some people he knew there, and one of them, as a matter of fact, is the, the fellow I ended up doing my PhD work with, uh, James A. Moore, who was a, uh, an organic chemist and uh, one of the uh, senior editors of this uh, prestigious chemical journal, the Journal of Organic Chemistry. And so when I landed at Delaware, I introduced myself to Dr. Moore, and, and uh, he kind of took me under his wing, and, and I started up again. And um, um, and got my PhD there um, under him after what seemed to be forever, but it was about five years. Uh, <laughs> and uh, that was 1971. Gradu graduated, getting my PhD. Um, 71, 72. No, 71. Um, getting my PhD just at an absolutely terrible time to. Um, find a job, because I, I wasn't interested in going into industry, even though DuPont was just right down the street, practically. I, I always liked, liked to teach. I was always interested in teaching, and we're looking for a job, looking for a job, couldn't find anything, set my sights lower and lower and lower, and and, um, and then happened upon this um, uh, offer by the German government, the, the city-state of Hamburg in Germany 
who was interested in hiring American PhDs in the sciences because they had this um, shortage of teachers in the upper levels of their secondary education system. It's called a gymnasium. And the German education system is slightly different from ours in which students are streamed very early on. So students who are college-bound go into these gymnasiums and um, and um, and the, the grades actually go through what we would call junior college. And so the, the, the Ministry of Education in Humboldt was looking for um, people to teach those, those two levels, which are mounted to the freshman and sophomore years of college. Um, and, uh, and they said that teaching this in English would be, would be quite fine because their students knew English. Well, that was mistake number one. <laughs> but it, it sounded like a, a, a great opportunity to, to go to Europe. I had been to Europe one time before, a few years before, and loved it. And, um, and my wife had just were returned you, from... Were you married at that time? Just married um, just, before, um, just before I finished my PhD program. And my wife was in, uh, worked at, uh, was an editor at Vogue um, in New York. And uh, so we, were, we had a little apartment in Brooklyn, and I would commute back and forth to Delaware to finish writing. And, uh, and just before we were married, she had spent five months in, uh, in Europe. And she loved it, so we were both hot to, to, to take this, this job on. And um, we were a group of, a small group of American uh, teachers and their wives um, that went over to Hamburg. And that was in the um, uh, summer of 1970, 71. Did you have any pre-interview at all? Oh yes, in in America, um, oh, okay. we were somebody we were in, came. We were doing recruiting mm -hmm. here. Okay. Oh yeah, one a representative of the Minister of Education, Herr Dreifal, as I recall, um, came over and uh, and, and um, selected us. Um, so there was somebody else going as well. Others. Oh yeah, there's several. Uh, there was about five or six um, people to to go over there to teach, um, and some of them had, some of them were married, uh, some of them had children. And uh, so we landed over there in the summer of 1971 and uh, um, uh, got started, found places to live. Um, my wife, uh, Ellen, and I lived in this pretty little village right outside of Hamburg because my, my school was in, the, uh, in a rather uh, snazzy suburb of Hamburg called Bergedorf. Um, uh, and uh, so I... Uh, Went to, got introduced to my school, and um, and I thought first of all that because I had taken German in college, and I had also had to read German in my studies, in my PhD studies, uh, that I thought just speaking it would be just a cinch. Well, <laughs> not so, not so. Conversations different than literature. Fan fantastically different, and uh, only realized that after we'd gotten there. So I was struggling to just sort of master the basics of conversational German. I remember going into the, uh, the head of the gymnasium that I was, uh, I was to teach in with my little phrase book in my hand. And of course, he spoke uh, no English. It was unusual, but he didn't speak very much English at all. Uh, and so starting off teaching was, um, was a revelation because I... I started speak, teaching in English as per plan. And after a few days, I realized that my students were not getting it. They just couldn't manage it. They, they, they knew how to do, you know, con again, just the basic conversational English. They could, they could sing Beatles songs. They could, uh, they could do all kinds. But they couldn't master chemistry. Uh, in English. In English, quite a difference. And so... so uh, uh, and we liked each other. The students thought I was kind of unusual and refreshing. And, and they were very eager to learn, too, uh, because in Germany, um, your, your grade, your, your final grade in the gymnasium, uh, whether you, if you did well on it, that was basically an entrance into the university system. 
um, there in Germany. You could go anywhere you wanted to if you if you got a, a certain level. So they were very serious about good grades there, um, but they weren't. They just weren't getting it. And so I, oh, I got, we got to this agreement with my students, and I said, "Well, I know chemistry a lot better than you do, and you know German a lot better than I do. So let's just see what we can do." So. I started trying to teach in German. Well, it was pretty rough going for a, a while, but um, uh, total immersion is is a pretty it good way work. to learn it. Right. And it so, does work. And so, yeah, it works. And after a few hilarious um, uh, miscues and everything, after about six weeks, I was doing passively well. I was having to write out everything that I was going to say the next day, uh, the night before. And uh, it was very exhausting. Um, but, but they were getting it better, and I was understanding it better. And um, after six months, I remember waking up having had a dream, and, and I dreamed I was speaking in German. And so somebody said, oh, that means that you've really mastered the language. Well. Not really, but but I, I got along, and and the longer I was there, the better it got, of course. What did your wife do while she while you were there? She um she had been working at Vogue for some years, and uh, she was she wanted to take a vacation. Um, when she did look for jobs, there was some difficulty about uh, work permits and things, sure. and and but the main one difficulty was the uh, the fact that. You know, when I got a school vacation, she would have been working, and one of our uh, goals was to travel as much as we can. It was very nice in the German school system because you could uh, every about every six weeks there was like a little week vacation. Things that um, that, that we never heard of in America. There was a well, we have it in Purdue, the fall break. You know, in German it was the fall break about about the same time. It was called the Kartoffelferien, or the potato vacation. Historically, the kids would go home to help their parents dig the potatoes up, you know, to help feed them through the winter. But, uh, of course, they didn't do that anymore, certainly in this fancy... The name carries on. Certainly, yeah. So, so, uh, the law, so, so my wife stayed at home, and she was just an excellent seamstress. She was a good cook, and she just absorbed the German culture very, very quickly. She she learned to speak just as well as I did, sure. um, um, and, and and we we made friends over there. Some friends that that, uh, that I still have that I still correspond with. Um, and um, my first, so it, it started to go better and better. And you know you that's the only way to really to, to learn a culture is to be right down in it. Sure. Right. And we um, so at the end of my two year contract there. They asked me to stay on another year because they brought in a new a group of people to, to, to um, a new group of professors. Um, and and I helped train them and I also continued doing my own teaching. And after the end of the third year they said, well, we'd like you to stay. And it's one of those great moments that we don't have very often in our lives that you know that your path will be very, very different if you choose one or choose the other. And, and then I was thinking of the Robert Frost poem that I talked about the other day, you know, the two paths diverging in the woods. And and I thought it would be wonderful because the, the pay was great. It was a, it was a wonderful um, place in the community. Teaching uh, education is very, very respected over there. Um, but I was I, I decided in the end to come back to the United States just because it was just you, you don't appreciate the United States nearly as much uh, as when you've gone somewhere else and, and found out how good it is back home. So we came back um, and um, after a little bit of huffing and puffing, I um, um, uh, got to, uh, took a teaching slash postdoc position at Clemson University and um, was there for uh, three years um, and uh, really um, that's when I, my interest in, in, in 
in, in the teaching end of chemistry you know, really took root because I worked with a great guy there named Joe Allen, whose mentor was from Purdue. He was a professor here who's still alive, retired. His name is Sam Postlewaite. He was a professor in botany, and he originated this type of teaching, which was a sort of a, in retrospect, we call it mastery-based. But um, it was a wonderful way to make sure that your students got what you're trying to, to, to get to them. I remember Sam's little credo was, telling ain't teaching and listening ain't learning. And uh, he, he was a great guy, a great guy. And so, so then that was my first visit to Purdue when I was there. I came, well, I came up here for a conference one summer in 1976. Uh, and um, uh, little did I know I was going to cycle back. So, so I went from there to um, Central Michigan University. By that time, I was divorced, and I was the Did single. Did you have any children at that time? Single parent of okay. a little girl who was just one. And um, so there I was in the middle of Michigan, um, in Mount Pleasant, Michigan, and uh, with Molly, who was uh, not quite one, just and uh, teaching. At, at, at Central Michigan University. Uh, my third year there, during my third year there, I, I started thinking, well, I didn't want to, I did not like the way that my career path was looking. Um, I, I just thought of myself as getting older and crankier and teaching from the same old yellow notes. And, um, and also I wanted to, I wanted to be able to spend time with Molly and, uh, and instead of going off and leaving her and coming back late at night. Um, and so I talked with the chemistry librarian at Central Michigan, a fellow named David Ginsberg. He said, oh, you must be crazy. You have a PhD in chemistry. What do you want to be a librarian for? So all, everything I liked about doing research had to do with going in the library and doing the, and, and doing the library work. So. So I think I'll take a, a whack at it. Well, he, he thought it was a bad idea, but I didn't pay attention to him. Um, I got a, uh, so in 1980, um, I had a, a fellowship to go to the University of Chicago, the library school there. And um, one of the reasons I liked the University of Chicago, the Dean of Admissions for the library school herself had a PhD in chemistry. Julie Hurd, who has just been retired for a few years at the University of Illinois in Chicago. Uh, and she was very, very supportive. Um, sure. And I started my library work, and I thought, you know, at the age of 40, I thought I was going to just knock everybody dead. I mean, I was focused. I knew what I wanted. And I had a PhD, so, well, I'm not <laughs> wrong. <laughs> I was... Uh, learning did you, librarianship. Did you commute then because you were at Central Michigan? How did you take No, I'm, oh. we moved. I moved oh. as I was a full time student at the at, uh, University of Chicago. Moved into Hyde Park, moved into married student housing, although it was just me and Molly. Um, and I hit those library courses, and it was like a whole new world. I mean, I couldn't, I was speaking English, but I just didn't understand it. And I remember my, my cataloging professor. Professor D. Catherine Weintraub, who was one of the co-authors of the AACR2, um, knew everything about cataloging and tried to tell us everything about cataloging. And I was totally lost. I was to and it was so humbling. And all these students, all these little kids going around half my age, and they were just sopping it up. Um, but I managed to sort of struggle along. And... Um, with my three by five cards. With my three by five cards, <laughs> yes. And uh, but the pro some of the professors there were were amazing. Um, I mean, there was some you know, some grand old men of librarianship, um, and uh, and they they knew everything about it, and um, and it was inspirational to to uh, to, to learn from them. Um, about halfway through my, my first year, because it was going to be only a little longer than a year by the time I'd finished the work, I thought, well, I'd, I should join some library organizations. So I, I went to the ALA Midwinter Conference, and it was in Washington. And it was absolutely frightening. Um, um, 
it was very big, rather off-putting, and I, um, I got a very bad feeling about it. Um, so in the spring, I went to an SLA conference, which happened to be in um, Nashville, I think. Um, and, uh, and it was totally different atmosphere. Um, very welcoming, very, in, very, uh, yeah, smaller, and um, and and basically, I was hired right out of that conference. I I had gone down there with my resume and talked to some people at 3M who had just acquired a a drug small drug company and were looking to to. Um, merge the database of their, of their products into the 3 m informational database and uh, they were looking for someone with an advanced degree in chemistry and they were looking for someone with librarianship credentials. Well I hadn't graduated but I thought well I want to take this job and so I did um, because it was it was make, I was making twice as much money as I thought I was going to make and it was sounded like it was fun even though Minnesota was a very, very cold place. Um, this is in Minneapolis? In, uh, in St. Paul. Oh, St. Paul. Yeah, the 3M headquarters yeah. are just east of St. Paul, um, the city of St. Paul. Of course, Minneapolis is on the west side of St. Paul. Um, and the uh, Min Minneapolis and St. Paul, um, wonderful urban area, um, despite the cold weather. Very, very good schools, very good um, cultural possibilities, um, and a very open sort of thing, very um, egalitarian. Um, and, uh, and of course, in the wintertime, very cold. Um, there's, a, there's a bumper sticker that I remember seeing that said, 30 below keeps out the riffraff. And, <laughs> and you would never uh, quite experience the... Uh, the clo how close you are to death when you walk out to a, into a into a minus thirty degree. Um, and that's not window. wind chill. And that's not wind chill. No, that's that's just the uh, that's just the temperature. Temperature. So, um, but I but I loved it. I worked in the um, corporate um, information uh, center for three M. That, that's their corporate headquarters there, and and uh, and um, worked for some very very bright people um, and uh, I was at I was at 3M for um, over 12 years um, at the end of that time uh, or by, by that time I um, my job had, had changed and I um, I was looking to um, to to uh, I guess it Expand my horizons, and I, I went to work for a small information, technical information research company called Teltech, um, in which we did uh, interactive online um, uh, responses to our clients, and it was, uh, it was fascinating. It was it was the best way to learn good database searching because you had to, you had to be prepared for everything. You had to be prepared for, for you know whatever they were going to throw at you. And you didn't know ahead of time, except one sentence. So um, our, your clients were on the line with you. Um, you were doing database searching, and you were feeding the results back to them via a closed circuit television thing. And so uh, they were able to to help guide the search. It was fascinating. It was an exhilarating place to learn, and uh, and I had made you know had very good friends there. Um, after I was there for three years, my wife, my second wife, um, uh, who had worked at Pillsbury, um, and uh, got a, a job promotion, which brought us to Indianapolis. And uh, our deal was that um, you know, the first job move was mine, and the second was hers, and so it was her turn. So we came to Indianapolis, and I did some consulting work for a while. Um, oh, you resigned from that company? I resigned from Teltech, yes, and uh, they didn't have, at the time, they, they hadn't set up to do uh, distance uh, searching, um, although they, they ended up doing that later, um, but the technologist wasn't there for that, and, and they were too small. 
Um, I did some consulting with, uh, with an information firm down in Indianapolis called IREC, and, uh, and as part of that, I had to come up to Purdue to, to do some research on um, electromagnetic um, um, shield, shielding um, uh, stuff. And I was, was over in the mechanical engineering building, um, well, electrical engineering building, talking to some people. And I, I remember having, I had, having parked south of campus and I was coming through the Stewart Center and a voice behind me said, what are you doing here? And I turned around and it was Emily Mobley. Well, Emily, who was the dean at the, well, the libraries at the time, uh, and I had known each other um, for several years when I was um, uh, through SLA. She was the president, had been the president of SLA when I was chapter, when I was division head of the chemistry division. And uh, so we had worked together on some things. And, and she knew me. And she saw me and she said, thank goodness she was still smoking at the time because she had come down for a smoke break. <laughs> Although I said, well, I've never gotten a job. And uh, so I said, well, I didn't, what are you doing here? So, so anyway, so we went to her office and started chatting. And it turns out it was one of these lucky things that almost the day before uh, she had gotten word that the person that she had thought they had hired as their chemistry librarian turned her down. Uh, and so she was, they had been looking for a chemistry librarian for a year. Well, I didn't know this. I hadn't, I hadn't uh, gotten this information. But, uh, um, but basically, Emily was happy because here's this sort of underemployed uh, chemistry uh, PhD uh, with library background who just happened to walk into the building. So, um, so I applied for the job, and, and very shortly thereafter I got it. Emily said, well, you have to be a visiting professor because you haven't finished your library degree. <laughs> I said, oh, groan. So, <laughs> so at the age of 54 now, I went back to library school. Well, fortunately, IU has <coughs> the best uh, chemical information, and the best chemical information specialty in librarianship in, in the country in the world. Um, Gary Wiggins was the chemistry librarian and he was the one who had, um, who had really created this. So I, when I signed up, I enrolled at, at IU and did most of our coursework. You transferred from Chicago? Library school? The, yeah, some of the, some of the um, yeah, a lot of the credits transferred. Um, by that time, the IU library school had, had ceased to be. Uh, maybe they thought they thought if they, if they were starting to get these chemistry people coming in, they, they just wanted to quit. But anyway, um, so I, I signed up for the last few courses that I needed to take at IU. And um, I, again, had some wonderful professors. Um, uh, a lady who, who made me realize that cataloging was fun, <laughs> actually. So I finished, um, finished my library degree in 1996. Um, and um, then became an assistant professor here. You were already working before you finished your degree? Yes. You oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was a visiting professor for two years. Okay. Um, and, uh, but, um, but this is what, 94 when you came? 94 when I came, August of 94. Okay. So, um, um, and immediately I found that the, the, the chemistry library there was, uh, um, was being run by an inter interim librarian, um, Bill Running, um, because my predecessor, John Penzelic, had retired in 1993. And um, he had been the librarian 30 odd years, the chemistry librarian there. And he had the thing set up to go as, as he wanted it. And, uh, um, and we had, I guess I could say, different philosophies about, uh, about how it was to be run. And uh, so I, again, brought my interest in teaching along with, um, with me and uh, was also interested in making the, the resources in the library much more uh, available. Well, certainly I wanted to market them, market them better. And so I started this series of, 
sort of informal little seminars. Um, and they, they shopped around for a time a little bit, but I finally landed at 5.30s on Monday afternoon. And, um, and I decided I would bring ice cream along because that was a good way to lure people in. They weren't just going to come for the ice cream, but that made it a little bit easier. Um, so I started calling them ice cream seminars. Um, and I remember one of the first ones I gave um, was uh, one in which I was going to talk about the, this very important chemi chemistry database that's called, referred to as Baumstein, uh, the, the handbook of organic chemistry. Everybody was sort of afraid of it because it was mostly in German. Well, I could speak German and I could read German pretty well. So, um, I, uh, so I, I gave a talk on, on you know, referred to it as Beilstein ohne Tränen, uh, or Beilstein without tears. And lo and behold, I was getting ready to start the, the talk when in comes our um, resident Nobel laureate, Herb Brown, H.C. Brown. Um, and he comes in, sits right down, pump right down in the front of the, of the audience, and says, "Well, I haven't uh, read anything about Baustein in 40 years, so I, I think it's time for a refresher." Well, of course, that put the made me a little bit nervous, but um, but he was a very good audience, and uh, and uh, it made me realize how uh, useful these things could be. Right. So, uh, um, one of the other things I inherited was. Uh, the um, Chem 513 Chem 513 course, right, right. which uh, had really been originated by one of the founders Dr. of Dr. Mellon. Of, yeah, Dr. Uh, Guy Mellon, M.G. Mellon, one of the founders of chemical literature as a distinct um, sub discipline of chemistry. And this was back in 1921 when he was a young uh, um, uh, lecturer here at Purdue. Yeah, Purdue. Um, and uh, Mellon had an amazing longevity. He lived almost to be 100. Uh, he was active in not only chemical literature, but, but also analytical chemistry. That was his chosen field. But he was an expert in chemical literature. He wrote the, the book that dominated the field for over half a century. Um, went through five editions. And... Um, and he had taught this course for many years, and then after he had retired, John Penzelic, certainly under Professor Mellon's tutelage, had taught it for a number of years. And so this course was well established at Purdue, which is good. Um, not many librarians have, a, uh, have, have the chance to teach a, a credit course in which they are the professors of record. Um, and uh, and I had such a chance, so it was it was wonderful. I dusted off the notes, and I'm, then I created my own, um, and shaped the course the way that um, I thought it should be taught, and uh, upgraded too. Bring uh, in today's time into today's times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it had been several years uh, since uh, since it had been taught. So, and of course, I kept on upgrading it every year because everything changes. Um, but it was a. Uh, um, it was, a, it was a great course, even though it was just one credit, one hour a week. There were still ways that you could um, get the message across to the students how Im important this was to them. Uh, and, and looking back, one of the things that, that, that came, again came around full circle is this, uh, these uh, methods that uh, Dr. Postlewaite had, had introduced uh, served me in good stead. Um, in this this course, in order to make it a more mastery based um, uh, uh, course, and uh, and it was kind of a nice symmetry to it, you know. Sure. Uh, my first visit to the Purdue would have been over um, twenty years before, and you know, I was coming back to sort of you know, the, uh, cast your bread upon the water sort of thing. Was that a required course for the chemistry students? Yes, uh, for. Chemistry majors, BS and, uh, BS and chemistry majors, um, it was a required course to get the what they call ACS certification. Uh, ACS is American Chemical Society, and they have a committee on professional training that has specific um, guidelines on what is required for undergraduate 
degrees and uh, in order to satisfy those guidelines and get the certification you had to have a, um, a course in chemical inf sure. information, chemical literature. So it was really nice to have this already in place before I was, he was here. Just ready to step for you to step in. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit a couple of your uh, uh, publications that uh, Windows Terminal Server. Oh. Yeah. No. Well, I'm uh, I am not a techie person, but I can appreciate um, the the value of uh, um, uh, of uh, uh, a. Uh, a device, a, uh, a method by which uh, you, you can make life easier not only for yourself but for your, your patrons. Sure. And this, um, uh, of course, the, the, the role of online resources, online databases became much more important. Um, and two of them that we had here at, um, well, three really, uh, that we had here at Purdue, three big ones, or uh, the the Baustein database, which is by this time online, um, the main database of the uh, Chemical Abstract Service, which is the big database for all of chemistry, um, uh, was ref the for, for searching. It was a user user friendly interface, but uh, um, to to help people uh, do their own searching, but it. Um, it required a client and a server, the server being where most of the data sat and the client being the part of the database which formulated the queries um, at the um, at the, the, the person's uh, own computer. Well, of course, the, these client-server systems were, were very popular, especially if you had to search huge databases because the database was too big for to sit on the person's own computer. Another one was the... Um, what we call the good old CRC handbook, the Chemical Rubber Handbook of Chemistry and Physics. And all of these had big repositories of data somewhere else, and then these little clients that sit on the local computers. Well, of course, they would always have upgrades, and then you'd have to upgrade each client. And, and we, when we had hundreds and hundreds of people with their own little clients on their own little computers, you had to make sure that everybody got the upgrade. Mm -hmm. And there was always one that broke, and there was always one that, that crashed. And you know, people who is even more uncomfortable with computers than I was. What we d were able to do with the help of our wonderful IT department and the, and the Purdue um, ITAP, the in, in, uh, information technology people, was to uh, substitute this, what they called a, th a thin client. That is, they would, they would put one, a big client just on, on a server here and then mirror that client out to everybody's um, computers so that when a new upgraded client came out, it would only have to be re upgraded at one place, at one central place. And all of these little thin clients, which are out on the computers, everybody's computer, it would all, they would automatically up upgrade. So it saved us a lot of time. It, uh, it saved our patrons a lot of annoyance. And it was incredibly useful. Um, it's something that Purdue did long before any other uh, university did, as far as I can tell. Um, and we had the happiness of being able to work with the, our IT people, both in, internally and, and at Purdue. And sometimes that's not very easy to do. Yeah. So, um, so I, I was very pleased, even though I didn't understand a whole lot about it, I, was, I understood it enough to know that, that we could save ourselves a lot of time and trouble by, by putting it in, and it, this was over 10 years ago, and it's worked fantastically ever since. Now, we're going, drifting over to web-based things, and sure. so, so its time has come and gone, practically, but during that time, it but was... But it sure was a time saver, people oh, really, oh, oh, oh. yes. It certainly was. Searching it certainly the chemical was. literature. Yeah. What about the um, 10 or, or so things that every chemistry librarian absolutely has to have to keep from viewing an uh, absolute punk? Plank, plonk, 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 yeah. whatever. Oh, just mention these, a couple of them. I yeah, think these are, you know, that that's just one of a whole bunch of, of talks that um, I gave at um, various meetings. Um, the library is very supportive of us keeping active professionally. And I maintain my interest uh, in or my activity in both the American Chemical Society, 
which has a very, very active chemical information division. Um, and in SLA, a Special Arbors Association, which has a, a chemistry division too. Um, and it, it was, um, uh, maybe it's just that I like to talk, <laughs> but um, I, I think it's more that uh, because of my research background, I could, I could see some areas that needed talking about. And um, and I had the, the time and inclination to, to to be able to develop talks on on aspects of um, uh, of chemistry librarianship, which um, um, were welcomed at these venues. Um, the other thing I have a, a habit of doing, and, and maybe some people think it's too cute, is the is is sticking a, 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 a silly name onto the uh, onto the talk um, to at least grab some attention, and and then when they when they come in, th they will sit down. and Hopefully, we'll give them some nuggets of wisdom, but at least the uh, the title is not is, is amusing. So that ten yeah, things. Uh, there was another one called uh, I referred to as Nano No Net, which um, which said. Uh, said nine things that people have to know about nanotechnology. This is a new term that it was very ill-defined in the literature, and so uh, after a little bit of a definition of what nano actually meant, uh, then I went through and looked at the data, various databases, Dialog and Science, and STN and and um, Web of Science, and and saw how the how these these concepts how variable the uh, the keywords and, and the and index terms were. Um, and again, if you wanted to do a good search, you had to cover all these terms. Oh, yeah. So it's just an example of, of uh, my having fun um, and uh, and maybe making it a little bit easier to, to, to swallow. Very good. The Mellon Cyber Chemistry Lab, this is something new that's over there. That is. Yes. And, and again, um, I don't, I'm certainly not um, not a techie, but in this day, when people f you hear students and faculty say, "Oh, I never go to the library. I've never been to the library. I, I was never in the library all my four years at, at, at Purdue." Um, and I would ask, "Well, do you search the databases?" "Oh, yeah." "Well, where do you think they came from?" Um, "Well, I guess the library." So. So the concept of the library is, as a place, I realized was not was not what not what people were thinking of, and so I wanted to to introduce the concept of, of to first of all introduce the library as, not as a collection of books, but as a collection of resources, no matter where you were, um, and uh, and to keep the library front and center. In people's thoughts as to, you know, how how were they going to get information? Well, it's it's obvious that you can't Google everything, um, and and some things, you, you if you Google them, you really don't, you can't trust them. Um, but um, but I did see that people using the library and uh, and. The, the chemistry library for something other than coming and asking for information. You can you can now you could look up boiling points and melting points and things online. But people were coming to the library for a different purpose. They were coming to the library as it's been referred to as the you know the third commons, the um, a place where you could go and study quietly without the, without the distractions of a dorm room or the distractions of student center. And you could very quietly, hopefully get together with um, your colleagues and discuss things and um, and so the Mellon the, the cyber chemistry lab sort of came out of that desire to to uh, instill the idea in, in both students and faculty's minds that that the library wasn't just a place to, to do those things that we had resources there which were just as modern just as useful and just as Focused, at least focus on chemistry, as uh, as anywhere, and some that you get there you couldn't get anywhere else. 
Uh, and so uh, I came up with the idea of the, the, the cyberchemistry lab layer, um, and which was kind of like a computer lab, but the resources mounted on those computers were specific to helping people manage chemical information. So it had molecular modeling programs, and it had statistical packages that helped you manage data, and it had drawing programs that you could draw little you know, chemical reactions and, and mathematical symbols, that sort of thing. Stuff that students didn't have on their own that were not in the general ITAP labs and that have been increasingly, uh, increasingly used, and we I hope even more used, by professors in their classes. So the, um, the idea behind the, M the MCCL, the Metal Cyber Chemistry Lab, is to make available those, those resources to students and also to um, introduce the, the power of those resources to professors who can then incorporate those, um, those tools into their lesson plans. And we're just starting on that. And um, Jeremy Garantano, who is the uh, is now the acting uh, chemistry library head, um, is making a real good start in um, in, in generating some some um, some lesson plans for for the MCCL. So I, I think that's that's something that's it, it's going to develop. Innovative, and it's it's in today's times, and it's like it's a course package because they're going to integrate it into their syllabus. Yeah. You've also got it in the library. Yeah. yeah. And I, I'd like to mention another thing, too. The, 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 the money that we used to, to um, uh, renovate this, this room, which had been um, uh, the current journal in the library, but now all the current journals were going electronic, so there was this space. Um, the money that we used there was, uh, was from the Mellon Endowment, which, is a, uh, which was named in honor of and then in memory of Professor Mellon. Um, and it was specifically, it's, it's, it's controlled through the chemistry department, but it's specifically to be used for, um, uh, for, for the library and, and to encourage um, the use of the library, to encourage um, uh, interest in chemical information. And um, it's, a, it, it's a great resource that I've used for various things in the past, but um, it's, uh, it's, it, it's invaluable, certainly, and, and, I, and I'm appreciative of all the people who, who've uh, contributed to right, the Right, yeah. Let's talk about any committees that you'd like to, um, do you serve on any, we were in library committees, any mm. uh, school and university committees? Um, I was a member of the university senate for um, okay. a, a few, uh, one, one term, uh, and um, s I had the pleasure of serving on the um, Actually, it was the president's council, I guess, or something like that. It was part of the university senate that met with the, with the president at the time, President Beery, um, uh, in which we we brought up issues in our own schools, uh, now calling just um, uh, that uh, uh, to his attention uh, and to the attention of the problems to Bob Ringel um, that. He, he probably wouldn't wouldn't have gotten to to other channels, and it was an interesting way to get to know um, President Beering, who was um, uh, surprisingly uh, well versed in a lot of in parts of the university. Um, uh, I was amazed at that, um, and uh, and very uh, very less very much less um, off putting than than I think that people he, he came across in and other circumstances. And, uh, he also liked the fact that I spoke German, too. Um, and uh, uh, although our accents are very different, <laughs> his is from South Germany, I was from North. Um, um, and, uh, and I worked on uh, another committee, um, university resources. Uh, That's a Senate committee. Yes, a Senate committee. Sure. Um, Again, uh, uh, to, to see the inner workings of, of how university resources are allocated and, and the pressures that exist to uh, make a certain amount of money go a lot of ways uh, it was, was, was very, very um, 
um, instructive. Um, within the libraries, I, gosh, I, I worked on all kinds of things. Um, search committees, which, which was fun because we got to interview candidates and, and right. see about the future of the libraries. And, um, and, uh, and some other ones that, that um, you kind of always wondered, you know, what happened to the results of this committee? Um, but uh, some that were kind of neat little uh, task-focused ones. One that we just got through uh, a week or so ago on uh, redoing the instructional um, uh, record-keeping uh, website that, uh, that we wondered if it was being used to its to its full extent. So, um, you know, I it, 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 it's interesting. I mean, looking back over my career, the, the when I first started um, and it was at 3M, people would refer to me as a, a chemist who's kind of sitting in the library. Um, but when I came to Purdue, um, I, I my identification was just the libraries, um, and I, I never forgot that because. Um, some of my colleagues uh, in the past and uh, had sort of insulated themselves in the libraries and, and run their own little show and I I didn't think that was wise um, and um, so I've never forgotten who pays the uh, who pays my who pays who, who, who signs my check at the end of the month <laughs> there you go. and and it, it's really it's really been I've been very lucky in, in, in many ways. Um, lucky that Emily came down the stairs when she did. Lucky that I um, have been successful far beyond what I think I deserve. Um, but um, in, in, in luckiest of all that, that after you know, 15 years of being here at Purdue and then and another 15 years previously um, working in industry, that I always have loved the job. I mean, it's 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 fun to come to work Monday morning, um, and that's that's a very rare uh, um, uh, situation. And um, I uh, and of all the of all the good jobs in the libraries, I mean, the best one has been this last one. So I mean, when I am thinking about retiring, when I thought about retiring, I think. Oh gosh, you know this is wonderful. Why give it up? But, but you know, you, you I think of Satchel Page um, uh, saying about you know, don't look, don't ever look back. Something might be gaining on you, and and I know that that there are a lot of better hands that can do this job. So I'm happy to uh, to, to pass it off. Well, that you know. kind of closes. But one final thing I want to ask you: mm. What is your plans now? Oh. Well, you can just make a couple for the yeah, researchers. Yeah, I've got. You're um, going to keep in touch. I'm course. definitely going to keep in touch okay. because I've got very good friends here, both in chemistry and in the libraries. I am. Um, um, I'm going to be doing some. Keep on some professional things. I've got some translation work that I'm doing for a, a German um, database company, and and also doing some um, some work with with this. Chem handbook of Chemistry and Physics, identifying new compounds and running down their, their properties. Um, but uh, I, uh, I still love Europe. I have good friends over there. I'm planning to spend a lot of time over there. Moving back down to where my family's from, down to the Carolinas, and, um, and maybe uh, have a chance to, to read some of the books that I've been buying over the past <laughs> Multi years and trucking around with me. Um, that's one thing about librarians. We buy the books. We don't necessarily read them. And so I'm, <laughs> I want to take some time and read them now. Okay. <laughs> Bart, I want to thank you very much. We want to wish you a lot of luck. And for the researchers, he's, since he's been on halftime, his official retirement date will be the end of this year, but we're doing a special event for him before he gets away. Mm -hmm. Good. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you, Katie. Uh,